All right, everyone, welcome to another episode of the Twimmo AI podcast. I am your host, Sam Charrington, and today I'm joined by Chris Latner. Chris is the CEO and co-founder of Modular AI. Before we get into today's conversation, be sure to take a moment to head over to Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or your listening platform of choice. And if you enjoy the show, please leave us a five-star rating and review. Chris, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Sam, it's great to be here. It is great to have you on the show. The last time we got a chance to speak was, I think, back in 2020 around this time for the the big, great ML language undebate. But you've, uh, I think, you've switched teams from a language perspective since we. It's we pretty last funny spoke. connection, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think there's a new contender. There's a new entrant on the field. How about that? There's a new contender in town. Yes, and uh, we will get deep into into that conversation. But before we dive into Mojo, uh, the new contender that we're speaking of and will be speaking of, and all the work that you're doing on it, I'd love to have you share a little bit about your background. Uh, refresh uh, our audience with you and some of the things that you've been up to. Yeah, sounds great. So I've been uh, kicking around the software industry for a number of years now and have built and worked on a lot of different kind of low-level languages and compilers and other technologies in the developer tool space. Um, Have a lot of fun with that and have been learning a lot. And so I'm most well-known for open source things like the LLVM compiler, the Swift programming language, things like this. Um, but I got interested in, in AI in 2016 and 2016, it feels like forever ago now, but at the time <laughs> I felt like all the best work had been done and it was just such a outrageous new approach to solving old problems. And so I just got into it deeper and deeper and deeper and good news, not everything in AI is done yet. So, uh, I didn't quite miss the boat, but from there, uh, went through many different parts of the journey, worked on Google TPUs um, and TensorFlow and a bunch of other things like that, um, built more production systems, uh, worked on hardware and have touched many different parts of this elephant. And so at Modular, we're here taking, um, you know, I, I bring a lot of experience with a lot of different parts of the stack and we're trying to help lift AI to the next level. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And uh, at least a part of that is in developing and promoting a new language for AI, uh, and that is Mojo. Can you talk a little bit about Mojo and uh, its significance? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that if you if you zoom out um, to understand what Mojo is, you have to understand where it came from. And so um, when we started Modular, our quest is to make it much easier to build, deploy, and evolve AI research. And so taking research, lifting it to new levels, and then getting that research into production. Now, this is, this is a quest that many people have been on for a really long time, but it's really about making this whole technology stack more accessible and make it so more people can play in it so that experts at many different levels of the stack don't get stuck in one level. And one of the things, if you zoom into something like TensorFlow or zoom into something like PyTorch, you'll find is that uh, many people work at the Python level which is fantastic and they know how to build models and things like this, but uh, researchers who want to push the boundaries end up having to work at the C++ level. And like, that's one of the dark truths of Python is that deep down underneath it, when you get down to things that care about performance or care about hardware, you quickly end up in C and C++ land. But AI is even worse than (laughs) more challenged than most Python systems code because now you bring in GPUs and TPUs and accelerators and all this kind of stuff. And so now you end up in this, actually a three world problem where you have Python at the high level, you have C++ in the, the guts, and then you have things like CUDA and other uh, accelerator languages underneath. And so Mojo is a solution to this equation, right? We're, where at Modular we're building and solving and tackling a lot of these old problems in terms of how do you get models to be expressed in a natural way? How do you uh, map it onto accelerators and different kinds of heterogeneous fancy hardware that people keep coming out with? And how do you make it hackable for researchers? And to do that, you have to get rid of this three world problem. And the stack we built is really novel and the way it works underneath the covers is quite unique. And so we needed a way to program that whole stack top to bottom. And so we needed one language that could scale. And so Mojo is, is kind of that, right? It starts from this, this requirement of let's pull together this three world problem into something that is consistent, but then we need a syntax. And so when we decided, okay, well, we have a really interesting and cool to a compiler nerd uh, set of compiler technologies under the the covers to enable all these accelerators and all this uh, 
this fancy low level heterogeneous blah 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 all the all, all the technology stuff, right? We need to, we needed a user interface, and so as part of doing this, we said, well, you know, Python is the obvious thing, right? Python powers so much of AI, so much of data science in general, and so what we decided to do is build Mojo into a superset of Python, so that first of all, it feels like Python, and it's accessible, and it Python programmers already know Mojo, <laughs> but but then. Uh, we can also give Python superpowers where now Python can scale down and can be high performance and can run accelerators and can do these things that it hasn't been able to do before. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, to what degree does the work you're doing with Mojo uh, build on top of or depend on some of the things that you've done uh, in your past lives around LLVM? Is that is LLVM an enabler for this new uh, this new tech? Yeah, absolutely. So um, there, there's a number of different things that modular and mojo build on top of and so you can say modular is a fairly young company we're about um, 18 months old at this point but it's built on many years of experience building a lot of technologies in a lot of different places and so a lot of the research has been done in other contexts one of the pieces of that is this compiler framework called mlir mlir is it's, you can kind of think of it as an evolution of lvm that has enabled a new generation of compiler technologies, MLIR is now widely utilized across the entire industry for AI accelerators, and it's been very rapidly adopted. It's something that I and the team built at Google, and then we open sourced, and it's now part of this LLVM umbrella of technologies. LLVM, as you say, is also a really important part of the component stack. So LLVM is an umbrella project that includes things like MLIR, and it includes like the Clang compiler for C and C++ that many people know about, but it also includes fundamental building blocks like code generation for an x86 processor and things like this. And so we, we build directly on top of a lot of that technology as well. And so that's that's all kind of integrated into the stack. And that's one of the, um, you know, you, you make the hardware go burr kind of things. And so that's, that's all super important. <laughs> and so when you think about, it, you, you kind of painted the picture of this uh, three world problem. Every time you say that, I think of three body problem. It's a science fiction book and, and trilogy um but it's three three you think of this three world problem and how as a an ai developer who is trying to um you know actually get work into production you have to kind of think really deeply in the stack uh, is the is the idea with mojo that you want to make it easier to go deep in the stack or do you want to make it uh, more transparent to the user so that they don't have to go down in the stack and everything is just kind of working underneath without their kind of needing to switch boundaries. Yeah. So, so at Modular, we have a couple of different goals, right? So one goal is meet people where they are, solve today problems, build a faster horse, <laughs> right? And so in, in that, in that, in that department, nobody wants to rewrite their models. They want their code to just work. Right. And so they want new capabilities, but they want to fit within their existing ecosystem. Now, when you deploy a model, this is something that I think many AI practitioners um, don't talk about quite as much, or maybe they, the practitioners and the researchers don't have coffee enough because where, where it's pretty well understood how to train a model, deploying a model is another completely different set of problems. And so, you know, you can, you can take this in many different w ways. Uh, one example of that is that. Python is great for research. It's maybe not the best for production deployment at scale. And so many teams will end up rewriting their entire model in C++ just to get it to go if it's, if it's a dynamic model, for example, a language model. Um, now that, and there's a bunch of interesting work and there's a really smart people that do that kind of stuff, but why is it that we have to rewrite our production model or our research models to, to get them into production? That's really unfortunate, right? And so we'd like things to just scale. And so one of the things that Mojo does is it's, way faster right and and also if you use it the right way you can also make it so it deploys without you know into a single a dot out executable and things like this and so it has new capabilities that that python natively doesn't provide which enables it to go much further and so it can be useful that way now another piece of it is we're building really high high tech you know the, what we call the engine that powers ai and we have the fastest inference engine that's unified across tensorflow and pytorch now Right. And that engine is built entirely on top of Mojo. And so it's not just about building a faster horse and like enabling the existing use cases. It's about like unlocking this potential of this next generation hardware. And 
to us, like that's equally important, even though many people see Mojo as being, um, you know, it helps, it helps out Python and that's, you can look at it as moving Python forward, but, uh, really what, where Mojo came from is working backwards from the speed of light of hardware. <laughs> and so, you know, we talk about Mojo can be up to 35,000 times faster than Python. Uh, that's because it's at the limit of what the hardware can achieve. And Mojo, some people will see it as it looks like a faster Python or a Python that has no gill or a Python that types enable performance or, you know, things like this. But, but it's really about what can the hardware do? How do we unlock the full potential? And how do we do that in a way that Python programmers have direct access to? But you said uh, Python that has no gill, that's like a, the interpreter lock or something like that. And it is one of many limitations that inhibits the performance of native Python. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, I think that if you zoom into Python, right, and I, I, don't, I don't know how deep you are in the internals of Python. A lot of people, folks use Python, but they don't dig into it like like I do. Um, and so... I don't the, dig into it like you do, no. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, I, I think you're, you're in the majority. Um, and so, uh, folks that use Python know that it's maybe slow. It doesn't scale super well. It, it can't use all the processors on your machine without a lot of work workaround and things like this. There's many aspects of the technology within the Python implementation that make that so. And so it has an interpreter. Right? Interpreters are slower than compilers, generally. Um, it has what's called the gill. The gill prevents uh, effective use of multiple cores. Um, the implementation within Python uh, puts all of the objects on the heap in a very specific way. And there's a bunch of implementation details that go into how it works. Um, Mojo is, I mean, interesting to, in different ways. First of all, it's compiled. Second of all, it gets rid of the global interpreter lock. Third, it changes its representation. Fourth, it adds types. Like you can keep layering and all the different all the differences here. Um, but the, the consequence is that it really is a, it's a different animal. It has different characteristics than what Python, the Python implementation uh, provides. And so because it's a first principles programming language, right, it really has addressed a lot of the problems that Python users have felt as symptoms, but have not dug into, you know, why is Python this way? You mentioned that it adds types. You know, one of the biggest things that's, that's happened on the JavaScript side of things is the emergence of TypeScript um, as being kind of this uh, JavaScript compatible language, but that is, is strongly typed. Is Mojo, does Mojo have that same kind of relationship to Python? Yeah, there's a, there's a bunch of very um, good analogies there. So um, TypeScript's super popular. A lot of people use it, um, and it fits right into the, the JavaScript ecosystem. And so Mojo uh, has a similar relationship to Python, where it's a superset. It works with the existing ecosystem. All the packages in Python just work in Mojo, which is really important to us. And so we don't want to break the Python community. Uh, many, many folks went through the Python 2 to Python 3 transition. It was really... Uh, quite difficult in various ways, and so we don't want we don't want to relive that. Right? Um, and so uh, and so you can look at Mojo as a Python superset, and so by doing so, you can pull pull forward all of the existing code and all that that ecosystem into a Mojo world. Um, there's a big difference though, and so um, actually, if you zoom into Python three as it is today, Python allows you to add types, and those types, if you add them to your code are there for some uh, linter tools or checker tools that can identify bugs and can identify you know, obvious mistakes in your code sometimes. Um, but those types in Python aren't used and can't be used by the implementation for runtime, exactly. And so because of that, it, you can detect certain errors, but you don't get good performance out of that. And so what Mojo does is it kind of takes that next step. And so you can use the existing, you, know, you can use lowercase i to say it's an int, you know, and, and declare it as an integer that way, or you can use capital I. And if you say it's capital I, that's a Mojo strongly typed integer and it's checked and required. And then it also is used for performance. And, you know, we see if you get 10 X, 20 X faster performance, if you just add a few type annotations and we have a couple of demos of that. Carrying forward that TypeScript analogy, what I've appreciated about it is like, <clears throat> well, a couple of things. One, um, 
you can you can add types without like fully buying into all of TypeScript and needing to know all that, but still get like a little bit of benefit without going all the way into kind of this new paradigm. Uh, and also when you are looking at code that you're not familiar with that is kind of fully adopting the new paradigm, it's still familiar. Like you can kind of make your way through it knowing that there's things that you don't know. Uh, if you're if Mojo enables kind of that same level of flexibility, um, I, I would think that's a good thing. Yeah. Well, so you come back to this uh, two world problem or the three world problem, right? Where you have Python and Python lives on top of C++. Um, so being a superset means everything you do in Python works in Mojo, right? So obviously types cannot be required because <laughs> Python doesn't require types, right? And so, so that's also, that's all true, but in the traditional world of Python, if you run into performance problems or you need access to system software or low level things, you have to go build a hybrid package where it's half C or C++, half Python. And so the value prop that Mojo provides is you can continue writing dynamic, dynamically typed code, that's all good. Um, but instead of switching to a different language to do high performance, lower level things, just as you say, you add a few type annotations. Right, or you use some lower level syntax within your existing code, and then you can you know put more effort in to get more performance instead of um, you know having to switch to a completely different language where the debugger no longer works on both sides and you know all these things. Got it. Got it. You mentioned that Mojo like gives Python superpowers. Like um, that made me think of I. I may I'm probably not alone in this that. You know, the first place I learned about like this Dunder, the Dunder uh, functions in, in Python was from Jeremy Howard in the Fast AI course. <laughs> like, there's probably a lot of folks listening who, who came across it in the same way. Uh, are you accessing these superpowers through like Python native structures like that? Or are they annotations or like how do you, well, first of all, what are beyond the ability to kind of kind of tap into lower level structures like what are some of the kind of superpowers or enhancements that mojo adds and then how are they accessed yeah so uh, i mean you mentioned jeremy jeremy's been a huge influence on me personally i mean you could say you can go back to saying like why does mojo exist and a lot of that's jeremy's fault just 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 between <laughs> us <laughs> right and, and he he's been he's been pushing for years specifically for hackability researchability like jeremy's Jeremy's got the unique kind of brain where like every, like the whole problem fits in his head. And so he can understand all the different parts of the problem. Right. And so, so yes, yeah, so Mojo has all the Dunder methods. And so if you want to add, you know, you want to make the plus operator work, you can implement the underbar underbar add method and things like that. Um, but then it goes a little bit further. And so um, if you look in the space of system programming languages, you enter, you enter the realm of things like Rust and C plus plus and like these kinds of languages. Right. And, um, the systems programming world for a long time has been pushing towards bringing safety into this world. So C, C++, you have a pointer, pointer dangles, bad things happen, your app crashes, you have security problems, all these kinds of things. Rust and Swift and other languages like that have gone further into making, uh, making it possible to get good performance without sacrificing uh, safety. And so we've brought a lot of those ideas directly into Mojo. And so in Rust, there's a notion of uh, lifetimes and ownership and these kinds of things that enable safe pointer usage and things like that. So Mojo brings that in. Now, these are features that, you know, obviously you don't have to use unless you're writing low level code and you care about getting uh, high performance in certain use cases. Um, uh, but having that available gives you a very uh, accessible whole stack solution that allows you to go all the way down and get Rust style performance out of a CPU. And, um, and similarly, like we talk about this hardware stuff, well, it, at the bottom, even on a CPU, you have many cores, you have these crazy vector units and matrix extensions. And like, it's really interesting to see the evolution of hardware because if you go back 10 years ago, it used to be that there was a CPU thing and a GPU thing, and these were points in the space that are very different and they were completely unrelated from a hardware perspective. But today that whole line has gotten blurrier because GPUs have gotten more programmable. CPUs are getting more AI stuff in them. A lot of CPUs these days have bflow 16 and like all these other AI things that are being built right in. And so we're getting a spectrum of programmability. And so a lot of what Mojo is about is 
unlocking that for people and making it accessible and making it so that, um, again, you don't have to switch languages just to, just to get access to this stuff. You know, that you're rightly focusing on CPUs and GPUs, but there's, uh, you know, as you know, uh, a wide variety of other options and perspectives, TPUs and other, um, you know, more, um, yeah, you know, uh, other kind of newer, newer and exotic. more specific, <laughs> more exotic. That's a great word. Yeah, exactly. Approaches to this. Do you, are, are you building Mojo such that, you know, it is anticipating all of these options or is, you know, when you you're focusing on making Mojo better use acceleration, are you really talking about, you know, GPUs or maybe GPUs and TPUs? Uh, well, so, um, so I, I spent a couple of years working on Google TPUs and Google TPUs are, uh, I mean, they're, they're an impressive set of technology and machines because they scale up to exaflops of compute. They're highly specialized for AI workloads. They're also internally really weird. <laughs> and so, and so to, to plus one exactly what you're saying, right? AI isn't just about like a GPU, right? I mean, so much, so much thinking around AI technology is, okay, I just need to get the GPUs lit up and then go. But uh, particularly if you start deploying, well, if you rang on a smart camera or something, the AI chip is going to be completely specific to that camera, right? If you're doing... Uh, you know, Google scale training on, on crazy distributed machines like that, that's that, that hardware is quite different. And so, um, this is where one of the things that's, I think very exciting to me as a technologist about Mojo is that it's built on this MLIR compiler. So MLIR is again, this thing that we built started, started back at Google. Now it's being used by basically the who's who of all the hardware industry and MLIR talks to all of these things. And so, um, if you uh, if if you're familiar with LLVM, LLVM as is is now a 20 year old technology. It's widely adopted and talks to all the CPUs and some of the GPUs, but uh, LLVM has never been successful at targeting AI accelerators and video optimization engines and like all the other weird hardware that exists in the world. And that's the role that MLIR provides. And so Mojo, one of the ways that is implemented is it fully exposes that power and brings MLIR compiler. Uh, you know, all the nerdery that goes into the compilers and it exposes up to library developers. And so it's actually quite important that you can talk to, for example, TPUs or other things like that in their native language, which in the case of a TPU is this like 120 by 128 tile and being able to expose that out in the language is really quite important. So anyways, that's, that's a long way of saying, yes, it is more than CPUs and GPUs though. Uh, CPUs and GPUs are the starting point, obviously, for lots of really good reasons, but we've built this thing to have really uh, long legs that can bring us into the future. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And do you see it extending um, to things that are even more exotic, like your graph cores and Samba Novas and like the, you know, things that take a very different approach to um, the underlying compute? Yeah, so, so Mojo's really, so, let me, let me bring you back to where Modular is coming at this because Mojo is one of the components of the AI stack is the way to look at it. So Modular is building what we called a unified AI engine. And so this unified AI engine, what, what the heck is that? <laughs> well, it's an engine. It's, it's an engine. It's not a framework. And so people are familiar with PyTorch and TensorFlow and these machine learning frameworks that provide, a, provide APIs. And so you get an end module and the, the APIs that we're all familiar with. Um, underneath the covers, there's a whole bunch of deep technology for getting things onto a GPU, getting things onto a CPU. And so PyTorch 2 just came out with this Torch Dynamo stuff and the, like all these, all these exotic low level technologies that make the hardware work. Um, on GPUs, CUDA is a major component of the technology stack that everybody builds on top of, right? And so our engine fits at that level of the stack. And the, the cool thing about it, particularly when you're deploying, is that it talks to lots of hardware. It also talks to both frameworks. And so when you're taking a model from research, for example, you have a, a nice PyTorch model, you get off hugging face, we have, lots of people do this, of course. Um, you want to deploy this thing. Well, you don't actually want all of PyTorch in a production Docker container, right? You want a, a low dependency, efficient way to serve the model. And so that process of getting from PyTorch and into a deployment thing is what the modular technology stack can help with. Now, as you say, coming back to answer your question, GraphCore, Samanova, all these, all these hardwares, uh, 
I can't talk about any relationships. <laughs> you know, it's not, uh, but the, um, but from a technology perspective, they're, they're all slightly different in high level ways. So some Anova's chip is, um, from my understanding, a, what's called a CGRA, right? Which is a super parallel, really crazy thing that has almost nothing to do with CPUs. Graph cores are apparently um, lots, lots of things that look like CPUs, but they their memories are all really weird and different. The way they communicate is very structured, right? And we all know CPUs and GPUs, right? Um, and so, uh, what our technology stack enables is um, if you're the Samanova uh, or Cerebrus is another example of a really crazy system, uh, like those people need to implement a compiler for their chip, <laughs> right? And so they're the experts on their chip. They understand how this works. And what Modular can do is provide a thing for them to plug into so that they get all of TensorFlow and PyTorch. And one of the major problems we have today with, with hardware accelerators, particularly ones that are um, not the dominant player in the space, is that um, their tools don't actually just work, right? So often, um, I'll pick on Apple, for example, right? So Apple has a deployment technology called CoreML. CoreML um, is, talks to the neural accelerators and they have all this amazing hardware on a Mac or an iPhone. But CoreML is not actually compatible with all the models. And so getting something onto an Apple device means fighting with this translator and trying to get it to not crash and <laughs> you know, doing all these things that the, the production world uh, struggles with. and. You know, if I, I talk with many people, many leaders at software companies that are building AI into their products and a lot of the software leaders, uh, you know, they, they see the symptoms. They see, okay, it takes three months to get a model into production, right? They, they see symptoms like I need a team of 40 people to be able to deploy things and they're very expensive, very specialized people. Why is it this hard, right? And the answer to those questions are that the tools, the technologies are not anywhere near the tools and technologies used for training. And so there's so much suffering, <laughs> so much, so many problems in these things. And, and the root cause is the technology I've been working on for years, which is um, for any one of these chips, people have had to build an entire technology stack from the bottom up. And there's very little code reuse across, across hardware and hardware vendors, Again, I'll pick on Apple, but I, I love Apple, so it's not it's not out of anger. It's that you know it's very difficult to track the speed of AI. PyTorch moves super fast, right? This is stuff that you need a very dedicated team. You need to be super responsive. You need to be on top of this stuff, and also uh, the compiler problems and the technology problems to make the the hardware work are really difficult. And so um, there have been a lot of really smart people working on this. But if you're always focused on getting the next ship out the door you can't take a step back and look at this whole technology stack, then you can't make the leap that modular is, is driving forward. Interesting. Interesting. So when you said something earlier, kind of describing the, the engine and its place. And it made me think of, uh, you know, for, for ages now, right. Um, <clears throat> we've kind of, you know, decry the kind of stranglehold, if you will, put a negative spin on the CUDA has on like the low level programming interface, which basically kind of keeps, you know, ensures that NVIDIA has, you know, a long lasting position and makes it very difficult for, you know, say an Intel to come out with, a, um, you know, a, a CPU with some numeric capabilities and displace it because there's all this, you know, A, there's all this code that's been written in these three worlds that you've mentioned, and like it's not as easy as just swapping out the hardware, right? Are you envisioning that this this modular engine is this kind of replacement for CUDA that is multi, you know, hardware capable? Is that the, the core idea? Yes. I mean, that's that's one of the value props we provide. So um, if, if I zoom out and look at the steps the industry has been going through, so... Um, we, owe, we as an AI industry owe a huge debt of gratitude to CUDA. <laughs> like if you go, you go back to the AlexNet moment, for example, right? A lot of people talk about it was a confluence of ImageNet and the data sets and things like this. It was a confluence of hardware. And the fact that GPUs uh, enabled a, an amount of compute that could cause AlexNet to happen. But a lot of folks forget that CUDA was what enabled some researchers to go write convolution kernels and actually get a machine learning model running on a GPU, which the hardware is definitely not designed for back in the day, right? Today, it's 
AI has taken over and it's a little bit different, but back in the day, that initial breakthrough was really in, in, in you know, a large part thanks to CUDA. And so one of the things that's happened is that as um, AI has taken over, right, a lot of technology has been built on top of CUDA and it's a, it's, it's a very good thing and it's very powerful and flexible and hackable and it's great. But as you say, it's kind of put us into a mode where one vendor <laughs> has this dominant position and it's very difficult to, um, you know, if you're a hardware vendor at even an AMD or some other widely known company that has really impressive hardware to be able to play in this ecosystem. Now, what, what's happened and one of the things that led into the thinking that went to, to modular existing is that there have been a lot of compiler technologies that have been built. For example, there's this XLA compiler that I worked on at Google. There are uh, new compilers every day being announced by different companies where they're saying, I will build a compiler that will make ML go fast, for example, on GPUs. Um, and so uh, several years of work, lots of cool technology, lots of examples of these systems exist, like and the names keep changing, but <laughs> the, uh, the technology is very powerful. The problem with that is that they have lost one of the things that made CUDA really powerful, which is the programmability. And so what, what has happened is the compiler nerds, which I'm a member, so I can, I, I love the compiler nerds, but those compiler nerds have went and turned AI code generation and things like this into a compiler problem, but that has excluded all the non-compiler people, <laughs> right? And so if you look at TPUs, for example, TPUs have, uh, can express everything you can do in this XLA compiler. And so it can do matrix multiplications, convolutions, element-wise adds, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it can't do sparse operations, can't do data operations, can't do pre-processing. And so um, AI, I, I, you're an expert, you know this, AI is not just about matrix multiplication, it's about data loading, pre-processing, this full parallel compute problem that is part of AI. And so what has been lost over the several years of trying to solve uh, the CUDA lock-in problem is that people have tried to make this compiler problem and now you've turned into a different lock-in, but instead of locking into hardware, you're locking uh, most smart people out of the ecosystem. And these compilers haven't been super successful at being compatible with code and things like this, right? And so what Modular is doing is we're saying, okay, Again, I love all these people. I've been working on this stuff for a long time myself, but what we're doing is saying, start from a different perspective. What is our assumption? Our assumption is people don't want to rewrite their code. What that means is you have to have all the operators, all the systems that go into something like Tensor, TensorFlow or PyTorch need to work. Okay. Well, that's a, thousands of operators each <laughs> and it's a really messy job, but we handle that job for, for the world, right? The other thing we say is, okay, PyTorch is really popular in research. TensorFlow is still quite popular in production. What, what we see out in the industry, again, every shop is a little bit different, but a lot of people have both TensorFlow and PyTorch. And so they don't want to have this bifurcated stack built on top of these things. They want to actually have one system that they can scale out. And so we make our problem even more complicated by building a unified solution. And so now it's not about 2,000 on the TensorFlow side, 2,000 on the PyTorch side. It's about 4,000, <laughs> right? And it's actually even worse than that when you bring in some of the other technologies. But now you talk about hardware, right? It's not just about Intel CPUs and NVIDIA GPUs. It's this other axis that then does a multiplication to this whole problem and says, okay, well now I have many different, there's probably a hundred or a thousand different kinds of hardware. And so where traditional teams have built a point solution saying, okay, I'm going to build a fancy compilery thing for one hardware for one framework in, you know, in one, one direction along this. And they built one of these, uh, I mean, you often very good tools, but they're very purpose built in one case, you know, we're having sympathy for all the software people <laughs> that have to deploy because software people, they don't have one piece of hardware. They don't have one model. They don't have one framework. They don't have one product, right? Their products evolve over the course of decades sometimes. And software lives a long time. And so they need to be able to talk to lots of different generations of this stuff. And so in modular, what we've done is we've said, okay, well, this is suddenly a very different problem from a technology perspective than building a point solution. And this, this problem, this, I need to solve this massively complicated space where you have hardware on one side, you have the sheer scope of AI <laughs> on the other space is what drove Mojo to exist. 
because we need a way to make this entire stack accessible, hackable, uh, understandable to people that are not themselves compiler engineers. We need people that know really fancy numerics and sparse algorithms and you know convolutions and or people that know their hardware. We need to know like all these people that are involved in all of this massive technology stack that we've been building to be able to collaborate and work together and build cool stuff at a high velocity, right? And that's where we think that Mojo is really interesting because as far as I know, nobody's done that. I mean, it's, it's like a completely unique uh, creation in the space. And, um, and we hope that it will really simplify the world. Um, one of the things, uh, you know, I, uh, we, we kind of joke about it, but, you know, our, our biggest enemy, you know, the mortal enemy that we struggle with at Modular is, is actually just complexity, right? And in the, in the AI space, there are so many systems, so many technologies, so many, uh, you know, layers of stuff that has been built up. And, you know, if you zoom out, coming back to, you know, 2016, I thought I was, you know, too late to do anything important in AI. <laughs> like what you realize is that AI is still not done, right? This, the stack that we're building on is adolescent, like it's, it's in its teenage years. And so what we need is we need to get to that next level where everything actually works. It's way more predictable. It's actually hackable. Uh, when you try and experiment as a researcher, the tools don't break out from underneath you. And when you achieve that, we think that the the impact of AI can go much further and that many more people can participate. When you when you talk about the the complexity and the diversity of underlying components, and then you talk about kind of how the lifespan of software kind of extends over generations of underlying infrastructure. It makes me think of uh, like dependencies and dependency management and packaging and all these things as like huge problems that need to be solved. Is Does that play into what you're doing at all? Uh, well, so uh, not directly, but the, it, your, your pattern matching, your neural net there is doing a very good job of pattern matching and, and seeing, seeing what we're talking about here. Um, the, the packaging problem is often because you have all these incompatible systems that are lashed together. <laughs> and so if you zoom into Python packaging, I mean, there's, there's a lot of things going on there. I'm not an expert in Python packaging. People I talk to that are, um, a big part of that is because of the C parts of these Python packages, right? So you pick, pick our old friend NumPy, for example, right? NumPy has a ton of C code inside of it, as well as the Python API. Well, packaging that means you're not actually packaging Python, you're packaging C code. <laughs> C's never had a package manager that's any good, right? And so, and so, you know, it's it's funny, you look at these old problems that we've been struggling with, well, you get rid of the C code and suddenly packaging is way simpler, right? And so this is one of the things that Mojo provides is providing unified language. And more generally, every time you see one of these fissures, like you're talking about the hardware, divide, you know, here we're talking about Python C++, we talk about CUDA versus Sickle versus HIP versus like all these other crazy things that exist in the world. Like each one of these things is at the bottom of our stack driving complexity up. And so at the end of the day, you know, you'll have a researcher who very reasonably says, hey, I just want to run this model on AMD GPU. No big deal, right? Should flip a switch, right? But the, the problem is, is that at the very bottom, all this stuff is very different and all the cracks go up and you know it's if you take reliability and it's 90 percent reliable and then the next step is 90 percent reliable and the next step is 90 percent reliable you start multiplying together all the point nines and you get something that's 10 percent reliable <laughs> right and this is this is the, this is the ai stack that we all depend on and you've got you've got you know this easy problem which is well okay let me be careful here you've got this one class of problems that is very challenging, but it's easy to deal with. And that is when you're trying to use all this stuff together and it just doesn't work, like it doesn't compile or it doesn't run or whatever. But then you have this other problem where it works, but you don't know that it's actually not working <laughs> because of like semantic differences or, you know, what have you. Um, it's either not performing well or, you know, your results are are, you know, you're not converging, your results are, are out of whack. And like, you're digging deep into underlying libraries, trying to figure out like, why are your answers like crazy? Yeah, I, I give you one example, right? I mean, just go through the life cycle of deploying a model, right? So to just, you know, make up a scenario, but 
um, but to just double click on what you're saying, okay, I want to deploy a model. Well, now I need to get it to go through CoreML or one of the many things for deploying to some piece of hardware. Results don't work. Well, now to just like a hundred, like just to just like plus one you a hundred times. <laughs> now you need to know not just PyTorch, not just your model, not just CoreML, but also the translator, also all these things. And you dig in and dig in, dig, dig, in, dig, 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 and you find out it's handling the edge padding on a convolution slightly differently. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, and so now wait a second. So like all of these tools were supposed to be making it easy, but because they don't, they're not all reliable. Like it's this leaky abstraction. Now you have to understand all of this complexity, right? And so this is this is what causes it to take three months to deploy a model, right? Fundamentally, and this is something where you know I think that many folks that are building AI products and they're managing, you know, they're the VP of software at some technology company, right? They just see the symptom of why does it take so long to get this model into production, but they don't realize that the tool set, this this fundamental technology that all this stuff is built on top of. It's not up to the standards of a software tool set. It's not, you know, no C programmer would tolerate AI tools in their quality. <laughs> you know, it's just crazy. But but again, this is just the maturity of the AI technology space. And uh, by solving that problem, I, you know, what we want to see is like way more people, way more technology, way, way more inclusion and in the kinds of companies that are able to work with AI and do things. And we think that'll be a really big impact on the world. So we, we've talked about... Mojo, we've talked about the, this inference engine um, uh, or the engine that we've referred to. We've, in the context of Mojo, you've talked about like 35,000, you know, X performance and improvements over a standard Python. I do need the engine to get that level of, um, of uh, performance improvement, you know, it is switching using mojo like lock you into using this engine like what's the business model there are you do you have licensing issue like it, it's both you know I, I have a bunch of questions kind of coming out here and they span kind of technical and like business licensing kinds of questions how how does all that work great question so you've identified the right the right players there's mojo which is a programming language it's a programming language that's a member of the Python family. It's really useful on, for example, just CPUs, which is the only place that Python plays. And so many people see Mojo as just being a better Python, right? Now we have the engine. The engine itself can stand alone and you can use the engine as a drop-in replacement. It works with TensorFlow PyTorch. It'll make your BERT models go 3x. And you're using it as a drop-in replacement for what exactly? For a traditional TensorFlow implementation. So, so actually, before I before I answer your bigger question, let me dive into that. So, what the modular engine does is you replace the TensorFlow with our TensorFlow, or your PyTorch with our PyTorch, or if you're using TorchScript or things like this, and so you just put in and put a new thing in your Docker container, <laughs> and and what what you get from that is massively better performance. And so, you know, TensorFlow is quite good at production, but we're showing three to five x better performance on, for example, an Intel CPU or an AMD CPU or an, an ARM-based Graviton server in AWS. And so you think about that and you see three to five X better performance. Well, that's a massive cost savings. Exactly, that is a massive cost savings. Well, and it's also a massive latency improvement. And so many of our customers love that because then they can turn around and make their models bigger. Right? And so now you can have a better product for your customers. And so you get, you know, direct impact on your costs, direct impact on your product. And this is a huge deal for people. And again, this is where, you know, I'm, I'm a technology nerd sometimes, right? And I, lo I love some of the, how it's built, but the impact on products is, is phenomenal. And that the engine is a really big deal for, for just like getting production AI to scale. <laughs> okay. So just kind of continuing down on that line before we, click back out, then I would imagine one of the commitments that you need to be making to folks that are thinking about using this thing is how close you're going to stay to the, you know, the development of that stack, right? Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Well, so, I mean, one of the things also that, um, you know, our customers love is that Google and Meta don't actually like 
support TensorFlow or PyTorch, <laughs> right? These, these people forget, but these are not products, right? These are open source projects. They are uh, hobbies maybe for the, the, the megacorps. And so you're essentially offering like a supported opt performance optimized version of TensorFlow and PyTorch. Right. But then to, if I'm going to think about using this, I need to know that I'm not going to get left behind. Like you're going to, you know, I'm going to wake up one day and I'm three versions behind the latest thing in TensorFlow. And it has something that I need in order to make my, you know, you know, 500 trillion parameter LLM work. Yep. Yep. So, I mean, we're committed to doing that. So I don't know if this is like a binary question, but yes, we do that. Um, but the, the thing that if you, you know, the enterprises we talk to that care about their costs, right? Um, often they want somebody that they can call, <laughs> right? And and if, if, and if you think about it, right, it's, it's, it's analogous to who wants to run a mail server themselves, right? You can run send mail or something, right? But nobody in their right mind does that, right? Why do we do this with AI infrastructure? It's because there's no choice. There's been nobody to reach out to, nobody that actually can do this. And the thing that I think many folks forget is that Meta and Google, they've, their technology platform has diverged a lot from what the rest of the industry uses, right? So they both have their own chips they build, right? For example, right? And they have their own specific use cases. And so they're not actually focused on making the traditional uh, CPUs, GPUs, and public cloud use case actually really good. That's one of the reasons why we have such high value we can deliver. Um, and so, so yes, we are, we are a this is a product for us. That means we actually support it. That means we invest a huge amount of energy into it. This is one of the reasons why we have such phenomenal results as well. So, yeah. Um, and, and, and also, I mean, to, the, to, to your other question, like one of the great things about being a drop-in replacement is that, uh, from a customer perspective at least, is that it means you can uh, undrop in. <laughs> like you can use our technology, and if you want to switch back, you can always switch back at any time. At some point, we'll make it back to that broader question, but... I'm thinking about like, you know, we've talked about uh, Mojo as being this better Python, um, but, you know, what makes Python usable in AI is not just kind of the core Python, it's all these other things, NumPy and, and Pandas and many other packages. You mentioned, you know, we know they have C at the heart of them. So at some point, there's a significant number of packages that you also have to kind of rewrite that need to be Mojo native, I would think, in order to get the full, uh, the full performance. Yeah. So um, let's dive into compatibility. So um, Mojo is still a young language. We haven't talked about that, but it's still not. It's not done, and I think it will take another year or so of development before it gets to be um, like solving all the world's problems that we want to solve. Things like this, right? But even today, you can import and use arbitrary packages like NumPy, Pandas, TensorFlow, PyTorch, whatever, directly into Mojo. And so a really important part of how our stack works is you don't have to rewrite all of your or port or touch all of your Python packages. I mean, many people have their own Python code. It's not just big packages like NumPy, <laughs> right? And so, and so Mojo talks directly to all those packages. You don't have to write wrappers. It all just works, right? And this is, this is a really big piece of that. Now, if you choose to move your code into the Mojo universe, then you can get the benefits that Mojo provides. And so if you're just talking to an existing package, well, it'll still run at Python speed. It will be fully compatible, and but it will also run with the same implementation, this default Python implementation. And so moving your code to Mojo can then unlock these new capabilities, but then you can choose to do that a package at a time or however you'd like to do that. And so that understood, in order to... I guess I'm curious, like how much of the like surface area of AI related packaging have you built or am I thinking about this the right way? Like in order to fully uh, provide the performance benefits that you're talking about, did you need to, you know, port NumPy over to, you know, kind of a Mojo native or to run on MLIR or whatever, at whatever level that makes sense? Did you, you know, um, pandas, all these other, like how much did you need to do and how much of that is done like percentage wise relative to what you expect will need to be done to be. Absolutely. Uh, well, so the answer is 
zero. <laughs> so our, 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 sol our solution is like our solution enables to talk to the entire Python ecosystem out of the box. So matplotlib, scipy, numpy, like all that stuff just works. Right. And, and that, again, come back to being pragmatic and productive, right? We can't, I'll, I'll make fun of you and I'll make fun of me from our last call on the, you know, like great language debate, right? The, 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 the problem with any new programming language is that a new programming language has no community, has no package ecosystem, right? And so that, that again, like uh, myself on that previous call and all the other lovely people there, right? You, you, you wanting to get ML out of Python for whatever reasons is is very exciting, but it's not very pragmatic because the entire data science ecosystem is all wrapped around Python, and Python's also pretty great, right? I mean, I think that that's something that um, you know people in other communities like to make fun of Python because of indentation or whatever it is, but Python's beautiful. Right. Subjectively, I will say it's my opinion, but, <laughs> and so what Mojo does is enables you to use literally everything in the Python ecosystem. And then if you want to invest more effort to get more performance, then you can do that, but you don't have to. Right. And this, this is, this is the major value prop. Now in the case of modular and why we built Mojo, our, our like business objective is go make ML really awesome. Right. And we want, we, we care about, the matrix multiplications and the convolutions and the like the core operations that people spend all their time on in AI. And so we wrote, we rewrote all of that stuff in Mojo. And so this isn't like rewriting matplotlib. This is like rewriting Intel MKL equivalent, right? Or rewriting the CUDA implementation of these CUDA kernels equivalent, right? And so that's where we've put our energy into because that's what enables unlocking of the hardware, enables unlocking of performance, enables unlocking of usability. And so, you know, we have really exotic, fancy compilery features <laughs> that, that enable kernel fusion, automatic kernel fusion and things like this that, you know, no, no normal ML researcher should ever have to know about. They just see, okay, it runs 10x faster in this use case. Well, that's pretty cool, right? And another thing that I think that folks are struggling with is that you know, um, uh, take transformers, for example. I mean, you know, transformers, I know transformers. We all love transformers. They're eating the world. Um, but one of the problems with this is that because they came, became so, so important to so many different use cases, we got all these very hyper specialized software stacks for transformers. And so these exist at the low level. So NVIDIA, for example, has a set of kernels called faster transformer. Um, these are at the high levels, and so there's all these distribution frameworks for transformers and things like this. And so you get this very transformer specialized stack, which again forces you into this very narrow view of what a transformer is, and it works for the benchmark. But if you're a researcher, you want to go push the boundaries and try slightly different transformers. Or, you know, maybe there's a thing beyond transformers. Like I hear that RNNs are coming back in, and <laughs> you know, maybe FFTs will have have their day, right? I mean, there's like all these different theories. And if we can't enable people to do that research, right, we may be missing out on that next big step. And so, um, this the specialization that's inherent in um, you know things becoming important really cuts against generality. And so that's that's one of the things that we've seen, and we, that we really want to like again, like if you dramatically reduce the complexity in these stacks, you can make it way more hackable, and that we believe will enable people to invent new things. Yeah, well, I want to push on this one more time just to make sure see if i can figure out what i'm expose any uh kind of fissures in my understanding here is is what you're saying that um or is it the case that you know when in thinking about the relationship between like a uh, numpy or pandas and and python that those libraries that you know, we all use as part of, um, you know, that are kind of ubiquitous in from a machine learning perspective. Is it, I can imagine a couple of things, you know, one that um, like they're sitting on top of the underlying, they delegate enough of what they're doing to the underlying Python that you kind of replacing, fixing that underlying Python gives you, you know, some percent of the performance benefit um, such that you don't need to deal with the 
upper piece. Are, defi- who, who, who is you here? Right, so are you, are you asking how it works internally? Or are you asking how a user uses it? Or are you asking when somebody should do something? Which piece, which piece of this elephant are you touching? <laughs> I, you know, I'm both try. I'm primarily trying to make sure that I understand how it is that you're able to offer the performance improvements that you're boasting without needing to touch any of the libraries that people depend on. And so I'm kind of asking about internals, but also like how they're used. So I'm imagining like several scenarios. A, you know, for whatever reason, you know, well, A, a is like, your 35,000 number that is, you know, that's kind of a made up number that uh, doesn't actually rely on any external dependencies and is kind of a useless performance boasting metric. That's one possibility. Another possibility is um, <clears throat> NumPy delegate, you know, these libraries delegate enough of their operations to the underlying Python that you can get the, you know, significant performance gains even without touching those things. And hey, if somebody did touch those things, maybe it would be 70,000 or whatever. Yeah, I, I can break it down for you if you want. Got it. Okay. So, okay. All right. So, so let, me, let me break it into a couple of categories. So one is you have unmodified Python that is just imported. So you take matplotlib, just to pick on something that's not performance sensitive. Uh, there's no reason to rewrite matplotlib. It's it's fine, <laughs> right? And so you just import it. If you import it, the way that runs is that runs with the existing CPython interpreter and Mojo talks to the CPython interpreter. And so that code runs 100% compatibility. Everything just works great. And like the, this is why the entire ecosystem works, but it's no faster. Okay. And so you really what you're getting at is you're getting at what are my trade-offs? What are the levers I'm pulling here? And so full compatibility, but no performance benefit. Those things go together, right? Another, another, another thing you can do. And so if you, so, um, if you go to modular.com, you can see our video and you can see Jeremy giving a demo, <laughs> Jeremy Howard giving a demo. And, um, and there, what you can see is you say, okay, I just take some Python code. I put it into Mojo. And now it runs, you know, uh, it depends on the code, but, you know, roughly 10x faster out of the box, maybe 15x, 16x. I mean, there's more we can do to push it further. We just haven't focused on that. And that's running the same code, but in Mojo. And the reason that you get performance is it's bet it's compiled instead of interpreted. It has a new fancy compiler stack, all the stuff under the covers, but it's still running fully dynamic typed code. It's just running dynamically typed code in a better way. And so you can get... You know, 10x out of the box is pretty good. I mean, that's that's quite nice. Then you start layering in and saying, hey, I want to add types. Okay, well, now you're talking about like changing the the, the in-memory representation that's saying to be way more efficient. Well, that's 10x. Now you say, give me threads. Okay, well, that's 10x. Okay, now I want to use vectors and do hardware. That's another 10x. And so if you stack all these things up, this is where you get into 35,000 times. And to, I, I will. I, I will. I will agree with you. By the way, that the thirty-five thousand number is a cherry-picked number. <laughs> this is this is a, an extreme result on Mandelbrot, right? Which is a simple algorithm we can explain and people can play with in a, in a notebook and stuff like this. But we have lots of people, just you know, random people on the internet using Mojo that are getting hundreds and thousands of times speed ups. And so, and so the thirty-five thousand may be cherry-picked, but reasonably expecting getting over hundred X is. 100x is pretty big. Like that, that I consider that to be a pretty big deal, right? And 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 you can look at that as 100x over Python, or you can look at that as saying Python's now 100x more relevant for <laughs> you know, to, to keeping me out of C, right? And the, that's both of those sides of that is really cool. Now, anyway, so coming back to your categories, and then there was there was let me add that third category. Um... Or that maybe it's more a scenario than a category. It is also, um, I think, largely the case, but maybe you can like validate this for me. Like, you're probably using a lot more of these libraries when you're doing like EDA and kind of like the early stages of like building a model, but then you finally have your model in, you know, the form of a graph and TensorFlow or PyTorch and, you know, at that point, like 
the things that you're relying on are kind of much lower level as opposed to like your pandas and your uh, SciPy, all this kind of stuff. And so your like your exposure or your need to pull in all these libraries at the kind of the point where you're invoked, like, you know, kind of core training loop or inference is less. Yeah. You want to like deploy the model. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, exactly. And so, and so if you, so if you zoom into the third part, let's just call, cause the things we just talked about are actually completely generic software engineering things, right? We talked about use an arbitrary Python package off the shelf. We talked about take Python code, arbitrary Python code in an arbitrary domain and just make it go fast. Right, which is fun, right? But it has nothing to do with AI. Now let's talk about AI, <laughs> right? And so a a AI, third category, super important. Turns out many of your readers or your watchers want, want, want to think about AI, right? And so AI is this really fascinating technology stack that, yeah, you talk to it in Python, but underneath the covers, you have kernel fusing graph compilers and all, all this in like accelerators and like all this other cool stuff, right? And so this is where the modular engine comes in, right? And Mojo, Mojo is an implementation detail in the modular engine, um, and Mojo makes it all super extensible and hackable. But this technology space actually really has nothing, very little to do with syntax or with a programming language. It's a completely different technology stack that's much more similar to like these XLA compilers and the the uh, you know the internals of CUDA and or the internals of Intel MKL or, you know, th these kinds of things. So, so these, these are all different, but come, come back to your basic question, uh, several layers up in the stack, which is what is the relationship between Mojo and the modular engine, right? Because that's also uh, really important. So the modular engine is really focused around high performance production deployment, go solve problems in AI. Um, and so it's an AI thing. Mojo as a language is actually a new member of the Python family, right? And so for modular, we see the engine as being a product and we see Mojo as a technology and both of these things stand alone. So you can use Mojo as just a, a better Python if that's what you want to do. Um, or you can use the modular engine as it drops into TensorFlow and PyTorch and then you just have a better TensorFlow and a better way to deploy your models. But there's a much bigger and I hopefully I believe much more important in the long term, you know, better together story here, right? Because putting a custom op into TensorFlow or PyTorch is very difficult. <laughs> you know, we we talk about um, you know the three layer problem, right? The Python, C plus plus, CUDA. Well, if you want to put a custom CUDA op into PyTorch. You have to write C plus CUDA is like a C plus plus thing, right? But it's a C plus plus thing that doesn't have a debugger. It's, it's a C plus plus thing with a whole bunch of weird constraints where you might wedge your GPU, right? And and like that that complexity makes it so people don't do the kind of research that they might otherwise do. And obviously, if you have to hack C plus plus, or even if you just have to rebuild TensorFlow, like who in their right mind knows how to do that? <laughs> You know, I, I know, I know these people and I love these people. Right. But, but this is, this is just monstrous. Right. And so the better together here is that if you're an AI person, you're building, deploying models, you're training, you're doing research. Well, what Mojo inside the modular engine allows you to do is make this whole thing hackable. So you can define custom ops, so you can get kernel fusion, so you can get all this stuff for free. And then when you want to go push boundaries, you can go crack open the box and say, okay, I'm going to write a a custom sparse thingy for my domain or a custom summary function that does some fancy domain specific reduction before I send all the data across the wire and making that possible is, is I think really cool. Interesting. Yeah. I, I feel like we've covered a lot and there's still a lot to cover, uh, particularly in this dimension of hackability. Um, but we don't have time to cover all that uh, to, to kind of wrap things up. I'd love to have you, maybe riff a little bit on like future directions roadmap like what are the the big things that you need to attack next to kind of build out this vision absolutely so um modular just came out of stealth and so we have a nice video on our website at modular.com if you haven't seen it um there's a whole bunch of new drops that we'll be adding to the product over the coming months um and so you can sign for our newsletter on that um the thing i'll say is that mojo is still quite early 
And so it's still, it's not like ready for production use as a general drop-in Python replacement, but we have an amazing community of people already coming together and we're developing it in the open. And so this is, this is I think, a pretty big deal for something that I hope will be important to a wide range of different use cases. I mean, Python goes everywhere, <laughs> right? And so, um, and so I think it's really important that we as a community build and do this together. And modular is obviously driving this because it's really important to us, Like, but, but we don't have all the smart people in the world. And so I'd really love for people to join us on our Discord forum and other places where we can interact and, and build this together. Awesome. Awesome. You, you mentioned that Jeremy was a, a big inspiration. I'm, I'm glad he wasn't able to inspire you to write it around Pearl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, again, he's, he, he's an incredible person. So he, he gives a killer demo in our, uh, our launch showing how to take matrix multiplication and he doesn't get it 35,000 times, but it's you know, 20,000 times or something in a notebook, which is pretty cool. <laughs> so it's, yeah, so he's he's an incredible person. Like, don't under and don't underestimate Jeremy. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Well, Chris, thanks so much for getting us up to speed on what you're working on with uh, Mojo and Modular. Yeah, it's really great to talk to you, Sam. Same, same. Thank you. <laughs>